Okay, guys. So this lecture is about the administration of John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, John F. Kennedy's domestic policy was known as the new frontier, as he was hoping the United States would embark on a new journey and new focus for the country. And Lyndon B. Johnson, after John F. Kennedy's assassination, created his domestic policy for a great society. So starting to tackle some of the poverty and more domestic issues here in the United States. While both of these men had uh, great agendas for the domestic for changes here in the United States. Both are also going to be dealing with the ongoing situation in foreign policy in regards to the Cold War. So starting to understand uh, the, the election here of John F. Kennedy in 1960, he was up against um, Vice President Richard M. Nixon. Now Nixon was the Vice President to Dwight D. Eisenhower. And during the Eisenhower years, everyone wanted to be like Ike. While there had been a lot of support for Dwight D. Eisenhower, things started to falter. Um, the economy started to hit a plateau and then start to go down towards the latter part of the 1950s. Plus, with the Soviets' advance in space technology, with the launching of Sputnik and the embarrassment of the U-2 spy pilot, um, people started to be growing concerned with the Eisenhower administration and felt that maybe they were being a little weak, um, that the Soviets were starting to win the Cold War or get ahead of the United States. So Nixon was kind of misled thinking that he would be able to um, ride on the coattails of Eisenhower's success and the Republican Party's success. But the Democrats are forging forward with a brand new candidate, a young candidate, and very charismatic. One of the differences in this campaign was the introduction of TV. TV was going to be a heavy media or medium influence for um, both parties, but the Democrats are really going to embrace the uh, production of John F. Kennedy and kind of showing him off to the American public. He was young, he was good looking, and he also had a strong partnership with his wife, Jackie Kennedy, who many women idolized and wanted to be like. So the debates, um, there had always been presidential debates, but this was the first set of presidential debates that were going to be televised, so citizens could watch them from their living rooms. And when they watched, they were just kind of mesmerized by the charismatic nature of John F. Kennedy. Um, his young, dynamic look, his experience, and the way that he was trying to present himself and his goals for the country. So those who watched the debates on TV were captivated by Kennedy and felt that Kennedy had won the debates. Those who went the more traditional approach and listened to the debates on the radio felt Nixon had a better grasp. So we're starting to see a change in you know, generation who still preferred radio versus kind of embracing the new mainstream. And this is going to be a help to the Democrats um, to get Kennedy elected. So the televised debates help win him the election. The other thing that helped win Kennedy the election is his civil rights platform. Now, he is an advocate for the civil rights movement, um, but he does not always have the support of other Democrats, particularly in the South. That is why Lyndon B. Johnson was put on the ballot as his vice president. Lyndon B. Johnson was from Texas, so they were hoping to pull some more Southern votes. Um, but his platform on the civil rights movement, John F. Kennedy, was very supportive of the civil rights movement. Uh, one time when Martin Luther King had been put in jail and was denied bond, um, being able to be released from jail before going to court, um, Eisenhower did nothing to try to persuade the judge or judicial system to allow uh, Martin Luther King out on bond, and Nixon also readily ignored it. Where Kennedy took the approach of contacting Martin Luther King's wife, Coretta Scott King, um, to, you know, tell her that she, he was thinking of her and you know, sympathize with her of the situation. And Kennedy's brother, Robert Kennedy, who will be his future attorney general, um, pulled some strings and talked to the judge and at least let Martin Luther King post bond so that he was able to get out of jail while he appealed the court's decision on his arrest. So those are going to win some major uh, notoriety for John F. Kennedy amongst the African-American population during the heart of the civil rights movement. 
So once John F. Kennedy is elected, one of the first things he wants to focus on is the Cold War. So just like we had with Truman's administration, the containment policy, and with the Eisenhower's administration, brinkmanship, here with Kennedy, his foreign policy is going to be known as a flexible response. Um, he, too, agreed with many in the public. He felt that the Soviets were starting to get ahead. They were starting to get a stronghold. Many third world countries in Asia and Africa and Latin America were seeking the assistance of the Soviet Soviet Union instead of seeking the assistance of the democratic nations of Western Europe and the United States. And so this is something that Kennedy wants to combat against. Um, but he feels that one of the things that alienated the United States was Eisenhower's brinkmanship, you know, the threat of constant nuclear war. While it is intimidating, it also doesn't, you know, while it's intimidating, it doesn't seem very friendly. And he says, you know, we should be able to have a flexible response. Our response shouldn't always be to go to nuclear war because there may come a day when someone calls us on our bluff and says, OK, are you really going to use your nuclear missiles in this instance? Um, so it could discredit the United States. So that's why Kennedy is going to pump a lot more money into defense spending. Um, and he's going to look at it from more conventional military standpoint. So building up our armed troops, um, making sure our those troops are armed with um, traditional weaponry. And he's still going to maintain our nuclear missiles and our nuclear growth to stay advanced and ahead of the Soviet Union, but that's not going to be our only means of being able to defend ourselves. So he also created the elite branch of the army known as the Green Beret, and he wants to be able to deal with situations, what he calls limited wars, um, with the more conventional form of military instead of with nuclear power. Now, one area where Kennedy is going to be tested is the island country of Cuba. During Eisenhower's administration in 1959, Fidel Castro is going to come to power and he's going to establish a communist uh, style of economy and a dictatorship within the country of Cuba. Many Cuban citizens started to seek refuge elsewhere because they did not want to live under the regime of Fidel Castro. Many of those uh, Cuban exiles are going to seek refuge in the United States since Cuba is only 90 miles from the southern coast of Florida. When many Cuban refugees start to come into the United States, um, the CIA gets word of Cuban exiles trying to plan a coup or plan a revolution to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba. So the CIA presents this information to Eisenhower and says, you know, maybe we should try to help them. And Eisenhower gives them the green light to um, contact the Cuban exiles and start actually training them so that they would be successful in their overthrow of Fidel Castro. So they train them. They also give them weaponry. This is a tactics that Eisenhower liked to use. He liked to use covert operations. After Eisenhower's administration, of course, John F. Kennedy was sworn in. Five days after he's sworn into office is when he learns about these Cuban exiles. The CIA and the Pentagon give him a presentation of their plans, of where they plan to attack, to start the revolution. They plan to conduct an airstrike to get rid of Fidel Castro's loyal troops so that the exiles are able to try to get a stronghold and get the support of the Cuban people on their side. This becomes known as the Bay of Pigs operation. When they go to execute the Bay of Pigs operation, it is going to flop. Um, the airstrike was not done in the right spot, so the Cuban troops were not um, eliminated or weakened in the way that they were hoping to. Many of the Cuban exiles who were trained by the CIA will be captured. They will be interrogated, and Fidel Castro finds out that the American CIA and essentially the United States presidency, which happens to be Kennedy at this time, are the masterminds behind this revolution. So Castro feels threatened. He sees it as the United States made an attempt to take him out. Uh, so he's going to cozy up to Nikita Khrushchev and the Soviet Union as a partnership and a sense of protection. This is a huge embarrassment for Kennedy's administration, especially early on in his presidency. He publicly takes full responsibility for what happened with the blunder of Bay of Pigs. He promises to never try to attack Cuba again. He also pays a ransom to Cuba and food and supplies to get the Cuban exiles out of Cuba and give them permanent refuge in the United States. So publicly, this looks really bad for the young Kennedy administration. It also looks like, again, we are weak to the Soviet Union or countries loyal to the Soviet Union. Within his cabinet, Kennedy is um, furious. He felt that the CIA and the uh, Pentagon had given him 
not enough information in the situation and was, you know, flabbergasted as how they couldn't know that they hit the right strikes or they didn't have the right intel. So this creates a bit of distrust between Kennedy and the CIA and within the Pentagon, which is going to play out in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So in October of 1962, um, a routine surveillance plane flew over Cuba. We have been doing this as a time, just kind of keeping tabs on Cuba and other parts of the Soviet Union. Well, on this routine flyover in October of 1962, the pilot caught images of nuclear missile launch sites within Cuba. Now we know that Cuba did not have the technology or the resources to make those nuclear missiles themselves. So it was safe to assume that the Soviets had given them those nuclear missiles. While the nuclear missiles were not operational, they soon could have the materials to become operational. And if they did, they could hit any major city in the United States with the exception of Seattle within five to 10 minute notice. So this is a huge defense issue for the United States. And immediately the White House is alerted to the situation and Kennedy calls in his cabinet to discuss what his options are. Uh, his cabinet members propose either an airstrike to eliminate the missiles, a blockade to prevent any other materials from getting in, or trying to go the diplomatic means through the United Nations to get the Soviet Union to remove their missiles. Kennedy ends up going up, going with the concept of a blockade, but instead he calls it a quarantine um, because it seems less harsh and less like a military tactic. And this was his way of communicating with Khrushchev. Kennedy is kind of walking the tightrope of, I need to appear like a strong leader, that I'm not going to give in to Soviet demands. However, I'm a flexible response guy. I don't want to threaten nuclear war, nor does he want to be responsible for starting a nuclear war. So he's kind of putting the ball in Khrushchev's court by creating the quarantine. He's not going to allow any Soviet ships to get into Cuba, especially ships that hold uh, materials to make those nuclear uh, missiles um, operational. So he's hoping in turn that this will force the Soviet Union to open up to negotiation. And so it, after the quarantine goes into effect, Khrushchev starts sending letters, um, telegrams to Kennedy, and they start this exchange of letters, you know, essentially starting to explain themselves what the situation both of their countries found themselves in. And so you know, Khrushchev made the argument, look, I understand you feel threatened by the nuclear missiles in Cuba, but my country feels threatened by your nuclear missiles in Turkey. He won in exchange. You remove your missiles from Turkey, we'll remove the missiles from Cuba. Again, Kennedy is trying to walk the tightrope. He wants to appear strong. You know, he's the head of NATO. He doesn't want to lose any of the Western European countries and their support or alliance. But he also doesn't want to go to nuclear war. So as a result, the United States agrees to certain terms publicly. The public terms are that the United States would stop the blockade of Cuba and they would promise never to invade Cuba again. So no more Bay of Pigs. In exchange, the Soviet Union would promise to dismantle and remove all nuclear missiles and launchers and all resources from uh, Cuba. So to the public, this really much seems like a United States victory. What was not made public that Kennedy promised that in six months, so six months after October of 1962, the United States would then remove their missiles from Turkey. But this had to remain a secret. So at the end of the day, Khrushchev is getting what he wants, but it does come at the expense of him looking weaker. Um, Kennedy was hoping that people would not make the connection of the removal of the missiles from Turkey from the removal of the missiles in Cuba. So this would maintain his position with the members of NATO, but also de-escalate the situation between the United States and the Soviet Union. One other result of the Cuban Missile Crisis was the establishment of the hotline, so a phone line that directly connected the White House to the Kremlin, so that hopefully in times of tense situation, such as the Cuban Missile Crisis, that the Soviet leadership and the American leadership could contact each other directly to try to solve disputes before they escalated to nuclear war. And the Cuban Missile Crisis truly was the closest the United States had ever come to fear of nuclear war. Now, another crisis that Kennedy had dealt with prior to the Cuban Missile Crisis was the situation in Berlin. 
Um, after the Berlin airlift under the Truman administration, the city of Berlin, which was in the heart of the Soviet section of East Germany, remained divided. And so Western Berlin started to be built up and started to prosper, where East Germany and East Berlin were not as prosperous under their communist economies. So what we started to see was a number of East Germans and East Berliners fleeing to West Berlin so that they would have more job opportunities and not live under a communist regime. By 1961, 20% of the Germans in um, East Germany and um, East Berlin had fled to Western Berlin, which was a huge detriment to the East German economy because they are losing workers. So Khrushchev presents its uh, situation to Kennedy, asking him to close all access roads to West Berlin. He says, you know, you could just give us this part of the territory. You are in the middle of our territory. It's disrupting our ability to function as a nation um, or to build our economy. So he hopes to get all of Berlin, but he would be satisfied with Kennedy closing off access, no longer allowing East Berliners or East Germans to come into the city. Kennedy refuses. He says, no, I'm not going to close my doors. I'm not going to close the roads to those who want to come to our territory. So Khrushchev is outraged. He says, you know, I thought you wanted peace. If war is what you want, then this is what you're going to get. So overnight, Khrushchev makes a decision. And in that time frame, he got the East German army to go into East Berlin with concrete and poles and barbed wire. And they start building the Berlin Wall. This wall will permanently create a divide between East Berlin and East and West Berlin. This does not divide all of East Germany and West Germany. It's just in the city of Berlin. But these walls are 12 to 15 feet tall and they are guarded on the East Berlin side by armed soldiers. They've been given strict orders, shoot to kill anybody who tries to cross the wall. So this is going to reduce the amount of people going over to West Berlin dramatically. There will still be those who take the risk, who try to sneak over. Some will be successful, some will not. But imagine walking through the streets of Washington, D.C. and having this huge 12-foot wall dividing you from the city. So you could be in a tall building and see across the wall, but you physically cannot get there. And the Berlin Wall became a symbol of communist oppression, the links that the communist and Soviet government would go to prevent those from leaving their regime. And so the uh, wall will be up for 28 years. It won't come down until November of 1989. Here are some pictures of the construction of that wall. Those on the West Berlin side, they could walk alongside the wall, but on the East Berlin side, there is a bit of a barrier. And here's more of an aerial view of where that wall went in to have that permanent divide. Now on the domestic front, like we said before, John F. Kennedy had this concept of the new frontier. He wanted to embrace this new concept for American society. He wanted to provide medical care to the elderly. He had a, um, importance for the role of education. He wanted to rebuild urban areas and he was a supporter of the civil rights movement. The issue is, is Kennedy, while he won the election, was it wasn't an overwhelming victory, um, which means he also didn't necessarily have a lot of support within Congress. So he has a lot of ideas, but it's gonna be difficult to get his agenda passed within Congress. That's where he's hoping Lyndon B. Johnson, who was a well-known senator and a very good politician up on the Hill, would hopefully help him get some of these measures passed. One of the things that Kennedy wanted to do to try to prevent the spread of communism was to start providing resources to those third world countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. He says, if we send in reinforcements and support in those regions, they will be less likely to seek refuge or seek help from the Soviet Union. So to combat that, he created the Peace Corps. Um, he sent, at first it was mostly college graduates, so people right out of school, very young, before they embark on their career, they volunteer in the Peace Corps and they go to countries around the world. Sometimes they provided um, agricultural aid, sometimes they were teachers, sometimes they provided medical care, or they just did whatever jobs were necessary for that country to help that country start to thrive. Um, and so they helped them try to build or rebuild, depending on the situation of the country. Um, and it was quite successful. 
You know, many countries embrace this concept of the Peace Corps. The critics of Kennedy called it his Kitty Corps just because of how young many of the participants were. But it did inspire other individuals, you know, some of them older, to participate, to do their part, to try to make a change in the world. A more focused program called the Alliance for Progress focused primarily on Latin America. Since Latin America was very close to the borders of the United States, Kennedy felt extra effort needed to be made there to prevent communism from spreading, particularly with Castro being so close to Latin America. He did not want to see that spread into the mainland part of Central and South America. So the Alliance for Progress contributed $12 billion to countries in Latin America to try to help them build up and not be susceptible to communism. It's not going to be as successful as the Peace Corps, but it is going to have some attributes. Another area of domestic policy is going to be the race to the moon. So the Soviets had beat us with the first satellite in Sputnik. They also beat us with the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin. So we wanted to make sure we had the first man on the moon. So Kennedy starts funneling money into NASA, science and technology, line of defense to start building this Apollo project to get our uh, first man on the moon. And that first man will be Neil Armstrong, July 20th, 1960. Uh, Kennedy was dead by this point. He never got to see the first man on the moon, but he is going to be the push behind that campaign. And talking of John F. Kennedy's death, by November of 1963, Kennedy was starting to campaign for a second term. And he still wasn't very popular, particularly in the southern states, because of his support um, and recognition of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. So one area where he was starting to campaign was in Dallas, Texas. And so he was there with the uh, mayor of the city of Dallas um, and his wife, and of course, uh, John F. Kennedy's wife, Jacqueline Kennedy, was with him as well. Um, they were going through a parade. They were coming up on a local um, old schoolhouse that was, you know, a um, government building. And as they were turning around, shots were fired and Kennedy was hit in the head. Immediately, Jackie Kennedy went to cover her husband. The car sped off to local hospitals. Doctors did everything they could to try to revive President Kennedy. But he will be pronounced dead um, upon arrival, well, not upon arrival, but soon after arriving to the hospital. The country was in a shock um, to, you know, we now have TV. This is going to be broadcasted on TV as what happened. Um, you know, of that generation, people kind of remember where they were when they heard John F. Kennedy had been assassinated. Local authorities apprehended Lee Harvey Oswald. Um, he found, they found his palm print on the rifle that killed John F. Kennedy. Um, he had been in the Marines, was dishonorably discharged. He had a sketchy history. He had been to the Soviet Union. He was known to be a Cuban sympathizer. So many um, investigators thought there must be some political connection you know, in regards to the Cold War as to why Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated John F. Kennedy. Pictured there on the bottom right is where Lee Harvey Oswald is being taken by local authorities um, from one jail to another holding area. This is being televised when the man there in the bottom right picture, Jack Ruby, steps out from the crowd and actually shoots and kills Lee Harvey Oswald. So this created a problem in the investigation because, of course, we don't have the ability to question the main suspect. So the Warren Commission is going to be the... Um, commission that is investigating John F. Kennedy's assassination. In 1963, they're able to rule at that time that Lee Harvey Oswald must have acted on his own accord, so by himself, and that essentially the case was closed, that he was the person who killed John F. Kennedy. 16 years later, though, in 1979, the investigation is reopened up, and this is where many conspiracy theories start to come in. They start to wonder, you know, was this something with Cuba? Was this something in regards to the Cold War? Was the CIA part of this? So there are many conspiracy theories, because there are those who believe Lee Harvey Oswald did not act by himself. But regardless, Lyndon B. Johnson is going to be sworn into office. And one thing that John F. Kennedy's assassination proved that was in time of such turmoil, we had created a system within our government to have a peaceful um, transfer of power. And so aboard Air Force One with John F. Kennedy's body you know, on the plane flying back to D.C., Jackie Kennedy standing there still in her pink suit that was stained with her husband's blood, watching and witnessing Lyndon B. Johnson be sworn in as president. 
we had this smooth transition where you know people mourned the death but the country did not go into chaos where in many countries this would have created a chaotic scene so now we're into Lyndon B. Johnson's administration, and he quickly acts. He feels that the best way for the country to move forward is to push through many of John F. Kennedy's um, hopeful pieces of legislation in regards to domestic policy. And so um, Lyndon B. Johnson uses his connections on Capitol Hill to get some major pieces of legislation passed. One of those is the Tax Reduction Act. To try to stimulate the American economy, they give a tax reduction. So $11.5 billion going back to the American people. So people feel like they have a little bit more money and they start spending. And as we said before, to stimulate an economy, you have to spend money. So this is one area where it worked. This was a domestic policy that did start to stimulate the economy. Things start to go up, which means for the country, more revenue is brought in, which allowed the country to start paying off its its debts. So we do see a, a considerable chunk of the national debt being taken away from this Tax Reduction Act. Second piece of major legislation was the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is something that John F. Kennedy had promised after the March on Washington and his growing support for Martin Luther King. So the Civil Rights Act bans segregation in all public facilities. So essentially gets rid of the concept of separate but equal. Another legislation will come a year later, the Voting Rights Act, which guarantees that um, African Americans' rights cannot be denied in regards to voting. Some economic opportunity. So to attack poverty, which is something that was very near and dear to Lyndon B. Johnson's heart, he creates you know, some um, domestic policies and domestic groups to try to tackle poverty here. You know, One of the criticisms of the Peace Corps is that it was international. So we're taking all of these funds and all of these resources and all these young people and taking them, taking them to other countries around the world, while the United States itself had its own problems. So uh, Lyndon B. Johnson created Job Corp, which was an organization to train to uh, train college students in job skills, um, and sometimes not even college students, students right out of high school. VISTA was the domestic version of the Peace Corps. So they sent college students or the youth to poverty-stricken regions within the United States to help them rebuild and try to help those places start to develop and have a fresh start. The focus on education created the Head Start program. So those who were in poverty oftentimes could not afford preschool for their children. So Lyndon B. Johnson helped create the Head Start program, which was early education for poor children. So families who qualified uh, could send their children to state-funded preschool to help prep them for kindergarten and then elementary school. One of the big domestic pieces for Lyndon B. Johnson was his idea of his great society. This would aid civil rights, this would aid education, but it would also provide aid to the poor. So he started to give a considerable amount of money to public education, $1 billion in aid to public and private schools. This was the first major piece of federal funding to go towards education. Education prior to this had been primarily the responsibility of individual states. He also makes two additions to Social Security. So instead of just having a retirement fund, he also creates Medicare, which is health insurance for the elderly, and Medicaid, which is health insurance for those who are on welfare. Mostly children are the benefits of Medicaid. Also to tackle some of the housing issues of those in poverty situations who may not have the means to be able to buy their own home or find affordable housing, he creates the Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD. And this is where the government starts to build what they call subsidized housing. The government will build housing and rent it to families of lower income situations or in poverty situations where they don't have to pay the average rate of rent. They get a reduced rate of rent so that they can get better housing and provide more for their family. The last bit here for the Johnson administration was the Warren Court. So after the Warren Commission had investigated uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, they started to make some other major uh, decisions in regards to the treatment of those who are accused of a crime and the role of police. So this is where the rights of accused comes in. And we have four major cases here. Matt versus Ohio is where evidence cannot be used or submitted that was found during an illegal search. You know, so this is where search warrants and the parameters of a search warrant are extremely important. A search warrant specifically has to say 
where policemen can look for evidence and it has to specifically state what evidence that they are looking for. So if they find anything outside of the search warrant, if they don't get an additional warrant for it, they cannot use it in a case against someone who is being accused of a crime. If they try to, that piece of evidence can be thrown out, even if it is the key piece of evidence that could convict them of the crime. The second item, Gideon versus Wainwright, is what guarantees an individual a right to a lawyer, regardless of their ability to pay. So you may have heard the phrase, you have a right to an attorney. If you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you. So the courts start to pay lawyers to be what they call court-appointed lawyers, where a person who is accused of a crime and is put on trial has the right to representation or to a lawyer to help plead their case. And the other, uh, in the third case here, this is where one cannot submit connect, um, confessions obtained by force. Also, this is where an individual can invoke their rights to a lawyer. So if one is being interrogated or questioned by the police and they ask to have a lawyer present, the police can no longer interrogate or question that um, the person who's being accused of a crime without that lawyer present. And then Gideon versus Wainwright can come in where if that person who's being accused cannot afford a lawyer, they have to wait for the court to appoint a lawyer to that person to be present before they can be questioned or interrogated. The last piece is the Miranda versus Arizona, and this is where many of you may recognize the Miranda rights. This is where you have you know, the right to remain silent, um, and a person must be told their full rights when they are being arrested, um, and they have to be told what they are being accused of. If you are not read your rights, and you are not told what you are being accused of, then the arrest could be thrown out. So many Democrats supported the, this piece of, you know, these uh, four cases of legislation, hoping that it would ensure the rights of citizens, all citizens, particularly um, citizens of minority in the United States. But many in the Republican Party criticized it because they felt that it uh, limited the rights of the police to be able to do their jobs.